what you want me to tell them what happened? <laughs> well, two people got cramps and they're spreading. We were all very hyper about it. And I have to go shower some people. Executive producers, President Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. I wanted to be part of the world, but I didn't see anyone like me in it. I hear about a summer camp for the handicapped run by hippies. Somebody said you probably will smoke dope with the counselors, and I'm like, sign me up. Disabled campers play guitar and sing. Come to Camp Jeanette and find yourself. There I was. I was at Woodstock. Campers dance and play baseball. You wouldn't be picked to be on the team back home, but at Jeanette, you had to go up the back. Even when we were that young, we helped empower each other. It was allowing us to recognize that the status quo is not what it needed to be. Sundance Film Fest winner. The world always wants us dead. We live with that reality. At the time, so many kids just like me were being sent to institutions. It was just a continual struggle. Most disabled people, like myself, are unable to use public transportation. We needed a civil rights law of our own. A Netflix original documentary. A rehabilitation program has been vetoed by the president because it was cost prohibitive. We decided we were going to have a demonstration. You get the call to action. To the barricade. Disabled protesters. A small army of the handicapped have occupied this building for the past 11 days. So many people from Camp Jeanette found their way into the building. The deaf use sign language. The FBI cut off the phones. The deaf people went, we know what to do. That's how we communicated to the people outside the building. The Black Panther Party would bring a hot meal. We were like this. We are the strongest political force in this country. Addressing congressmen. We will no longer allow the government to oppress disabled individuals. And I would appreciate it if you would stop shaking your head in agreement when I don't think you understand what we are talking about. Sit-in participants parade triumphantly. What we saw at that camp was that our lives could be better. A child rides his father's wheelchair. Protesters crawl up Capitol steps. If you don't demand what you believe in for yourself, you're not going to get it. I said Crip Camp, a disability revolution. Would you like to see um, the handicapped people depicted as people? Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Netflix. Hello and welcome to this BFI at Home event. I think I can speak on behalf of the BFI and everyone watching that we are so incredibly proud to have these fierce, impactful panelists in a very timely manner, as it's been a particularly difficult period of inaccurate disability representation in film. And these three, as well as Crip Camp, have been instrumental in changing the narrative of disability. I'd first like to introduce myself with a description, and then I will introduce the panelists and let them self-describe. My name is Kyla Harris, and among other projects, I am part of the BFI Press Reset Campaign and the BFI Disability Advisory Group. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a wheelchair user with brown skin and black hair up in a bun. I'm wearing a scoop necked black top with a porcelain hand necklace, and behind me is an art project chandelier and a jaunty bookcase. Nicole Noonan and Jim Lebrecht have directed and produced the feature length documentary Crip Camp. Crip Camp tells the story of a revolutionary summer camp for the handicapped. Camp Jamed, which ignited a community of people with disabilities to fight for civil rights and independence. One such community member being Judy Human. Judy Human is an iconic lifelong disability rights activist, author of Being Human and as part of 100 Women of the Year, Time Magazine's cover star. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. Hello. Hi. Uh, Jim, would you like to describe yourself and give, give us your pronouns first? Sure, um, Jim Lebrecht, uh, his, him. Um, I am a older white guy with a uh, very kind of white goatee and I've got black uh, kind of square rim glasses uh, with long hair. I've got a uh, kind of a, I don't know, burnt umber colored shirt on that apparently matches the wall behind me very closely. And there's some uh, movie posters there. And Nicole, would you like to go ahead? Uh, hi, I'm Nicole Newnham. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a, a 50 -ish year old white woman with um, blondish brownish hair, about down to my shoulders. 
and um, I'm wearing a polka dotted um, cardigan sweater and um, and glasses that I bought because they um, reminded me of Judy Human's glasses and, and Crip. <laughs> <laughs> one of my style icons um, and I'm really happy to be here with you today. Thank you. Judy, go ahead. Hi everybody, my name is Judy Human. I'm the oldest on this panel. I'm going to be 73 years old December 18th, I can't believe it. Um, the pronouns are she, her and um, I'm in the foyer of our apartment. I'm brown, I have brown hair which comes below my ears I'm wearing, um, what am I wearing? I'm wearing <laughs> purple, purple and teal glasses, and I'm wearing like a maroon lipstick, and I have headphones on, and I'm wearing a blouse, which is a navy blue with like ribbons of green and another kind of blue uh, winding through the blouse, and behind me, I have family photos and postcards that people sent um, hanging up on our wall. Fantastic, thank you so much. I mean, I, I just wanted to say that, I mean, I've known about BFI for so long, and so it's really an honor and really wonderful to be able to be here with, uh, with BFI and their audience. And I'd like to say that um, you're an example of what we don't yet have here in the US. And it's really wonderful to uh, see you and other disabled people and an advisory group, et cetera, that BFI is working with. And so for me, like Jimmy and Nicole, it's an honor to be here. It's also something that we want to bring over here. Great. I, I, um, I was saying before we got on this call that I, I pretty much went to film school with the BFI um, in London, going and soaking up every screening I possibly could listening to filmmakers talk afterwards and really starting to develop an idea of the impact that, um, you know, well-crafted films could make in the world. And so it feels really wonderful to be here today with, with, with Jim and Jim. Uh, thank you so much. And Judy, I think it's really fantastic that you said that because I feel like there's so much, I'm Canadian, but I have immigrated to the UK and I feel like there's so much we can learn in terms of, activism and film sharing from each sides of the world. So yeah. thanks for saying that. And so my first question is um, Jim and Nicole, although you've worked together on previous films before as sound mixer and director, how did you come about co-directing Crip Camp? Yeah, I, you, indeed, I, uh, uh, you know, our kind of the initial moment of Crip Camp was a lunch that Nicole and I had had and I had mixed three of her previous uh, feature length documentaries. Um, and I'm, I've easily mixed now at this point in my life, probably about a, over 175 documentaries. And I wasn't quite seeing the kind of films around disability that I really felt really kind of nailed it, really kind of really talked about our experience really authentically. And when Nicole was wrapping up the Revolutionary Optimist, her last film, uh, I invited her to lunch. I started pitching her these different ideas about maybe she'd like to do a film on, you know, uh, you know, non-disabled siblings, you know, and or different subjects. And and almost sheepishly on the way back after lunch, I said to her, you know, I I actually would have always wanted to see a documentary about my summer camp. That I knew that there was an interesting. I believe that there was an interesting story of this exodus of people from the New York area out to the Bay Area. Um, and that it probably had something to do with the disabled civil rights movement. Um, you know, for me, uh, knowing Jim at that point for 15 years, um, he had always been kind of a portal for me into the world of disability community, which, um, you know, prior to Jim, I didn't know very much about. Um, also, he was a window for me into thinking about disability um, from a civil rights perspective because I would walk in, you know, to do a sound mix with him um, because he was the guy in the Bay Area that all documentary filmmakers, you know, took, took their films to for this like incredibly wonderful, you know, several days of sort of sitting there together working on the sound once all the really stressful decisions around the edit had been made. Um, you know, and he would be in the middle of writing a letter to a film festival, you know, saying, why is your filmmaker's lodge inaccessible? Why can't I get into it? You know, 
and all of those things were were um, opening my mind kind of to a different way of seeing the world. And so when he told me this story about Camp Jeanette, and I realized that just the very picture of, you know, kind of a hippie summer camp for radical teens with disabilities in 1971 was something that my brain didn't have a framework for. It, it made me really feel what Jim had always been saying, which was there really are not you know, full representations of, of this community. Um, and so it was exciting to think about having an entertaining universal story, like, um, you know, a, a, a teenage summer and sort of falling in love and having your world open up and, you know, something that was so cinematic and so, so universal and so fun and filled with things that I associate with Jim, like sense of humor and music and, you know, a great time, but also to have that be connected, as Jim said, you know, I have this theory that it, it, that there was a relationship between this liberatory experience of this camp and this movement that came later. So to be able to draw a, an original connection like that through film was also incredibly exciting to me. So the first thing we did when, well, first, first things first, you know, I realized I wanted to co-direct it with Jim and, and not have him sort of give me the story and me tell it, and that that was going to be part of the magic of it. And, and I asked him if he would do that. And, and he said, yes. And, and then we, you know, Jim said, the first thing we should do is call Judy human and see if there's anything to my theory. <laughs> so that's sort of how the, how the project got born. And I'd also like to say that, um, and Jimmy, you can correct me if I'm wrong. You know, Jimmy, when you watch the film, you, you learn that he went to a regular elementary school and that when he came to camp, it was the first time that he was with other disabled individuals. And then he graduated, went to San Diego, studied sound engineering, came to Berkeley, had a very prestigious job as a sound engineer at the Berkeley Repertory Theater. And it's not that Jimmy wasn't involved with the disability community, he was, but he was really in in involved with his work. And so I think as he was moving forward professionally and experiencing these obstacles that were requiring him to write letters and really come out more as a disabled person, recognizing that if he was going to advance his career, he, need to ad he needed to address the uh, barriers that he was facing that non-disabled people weren't facing. And so I do think that all of this really is a part of the energy behind the film. And I also want to say that, you know, Nicole asked a colleague of hers about whether um, they thought her doing this film with Jimmy would be a good idea, I presume professionally. And what she was told is, don't do it it's not gonna be professionally able to advance you. So I think, you know, there are many important backstories here and clearly they were wrong, both for Nicole and the film. And I think it's really part of the changing times that are going on now. And they've produced such an incredible piece of work. And it is also because as they've been explaining, the close relationship and the learning that they've done from each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very well put. And 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 really leads on to kind of one of my other questions which is about you know you seem to really have this mutual respect obviously you know three of you but jim and nicole professionally like what was your process um as kind of a creative director and a storyteller on such a personal project and how did you two kind of collaborate together seeing as it was so personal to jim you know, uh, I would say that, um, you know, the Jim's lived experience of disability and the things that he had wanted for so long to see represented on screen and to have people understand were, was the um, kind of like compass needle north of our project, you know, and so everything sort of revolved around that. And, um, and these conversations that we constantly had. And from the very beginning, I said to Jim, you know, I think I'm gonna wanna go away and work on some scenes and bring them back to you, um, you know? And, and, and Jim was comfortable with that, I think because we trusted each other. 
And, uh, and, and sometimes we crafted scenes together. Sometimes Jim would work with the editor. Sometimes I would, but we always, we, we always came back to these, you know, sort of conversations and, um, and we were lucky enough to have, um, you know, incredible editors also working with us who, who were part of this kind of family-like experience. And I would say we were all inspired by Camp Jeanette and the community as it was represented in the footage and the way in which people listen to each other and the way in which disability community people understand that they, you know, that the, that the person who lived the experience is the, um, the authority on that and trust each other, you know? So there would be scenes where um, we would have done something we thought was really great and Jim would say, that does not feel quite right to me. And we, maybe even all of us, even Jim, couldn't figure out exactly why, but we would just keep working, keep working. We kept screening for the community. We just kept, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, kind of like um, sculpture, just kind of honing away at it until we, until we felt we had something that was uh, an authentic representation of the experience and got to those truths that, um, that, uh, that I think, you know, had been pain points for you, Jim, for so long um, to not have people understand, you know? There was this one moment I remember, and I don't remember what the scene is anymore, but I just remember coming into the editing room and Nicole and our editor played back something and I had an emotional response to it. It was like, I feel like, oh my gosh, now maybe people will understand. And, um, you know, even thinking about that just, you know, kind of makes my eyes well up just a little bit. Because I think that there is a great deal of pent up, um, you know, emotion, anger, uh, that um, that comes from being discounted or just living with a disability, and some of you know certainly some of the barriers or stigma that you've had to live with your whole life that you know is unfounded, that it's not true, and um, and I, I do want to say that indeed this is an extraordinary uh, collaboration, and it was built on trust, and it was built on trust between us and the editors and really virtually everybody on the film that, um, you know, it, just that it was a safe space and that, um, and that a lot, when you do that and you have a collaborator um, like Nicole and I have had with each other, you feel like you can kind of reach for the stars and you're, you, you're going to be okay. You did reach for the stars and you got to them. <laughs> I, I did want to say one other thing about Jim, which is just that, I, you know, it, it is unbelievably difficult to bury your soul and talk about your own personal journey and then step outside of that and look at yourself objectively with a group of people who are analyzing scene structures and, you know, timelines. And, um, and we were constantly marveling, you know, at, at how Jim could do that. I think especially in a situation that was that where it was this emotional and this intense because these things hadn't really been, you know, seen on film in this way before or discussed this way before, you know? Um, so just props to you, Jim. We still don't really know exactly how you pulled that off. Wow. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I think as people with disabilities, I, I mean, I think that we often find ourselves in positions where we're saying, don't worry. Just, you know, it's like if you have some, you know, concerns, it's all right. I, I know I'm in the wheelchair and that I'm good. But, um, you know, indeed, I think in any artistic venture, right? You know, as you're a creator, you have to set this standard of like, you can say anything. The most important thing in every, every day on this film has been do what's right for the film, do what's best for the film. And, and um, so, you know, that was really our, but thank you, Nicole, for saying that. It's, it was, uh, yeah, I don't know how many people are like directing films about themselves and seeing themselves at 15 <laughs> or at three or whatever else. Yeah, I, I feel like it's, it's so difficult sometimes to hold, you know, when you're making such a political film as well, uh, to hold something that affects your life so 
uh, so much and is so impactful in the structure of the city around you and uh, the way that you interact with, with people who aren't disabled and who are disabled. And essentially we are talking about ableism as well and how, how, we can, in, how we internalize that as well as disabled people. And I think that if I can understand that, that tension that can exist uh, within you when trying to manage all of those things. And I think you did just such a beautiful job of representing both yourself as a creator and, and a filmmaker, and as well, you know, Judy, uh, being an activist and, and just someone who's so passionate about, uh, about disability and, well, human rights, human rights. So I think you managed all of that so, so fantastically. And uh, there's this fantastic quote from this, from, you know, the actress, screenwriter and director, Michaela Cole, if you don't show it, it can be erased. Mm-hmm. How does that relate to your work in Crip Camp? Um, certainly, um, I kind of felt like, you know, if, if not now, never, in regards to talking about things. And so that it was important to dig really, really deeply into the experience, knowing that we would take what was good and what wasn't and kind of pull away. Um, so, I mean, if we were at a, first of all, I gotta say the narration for the film, Nicole and I were, we, we were right next to each other. We were writing things, changing stuff. And, and but it was really my telling her the story and, and, and such. And it was that looking into each other's eyes and um, that was really kind of made things happen. and. So I did feel like that, um, I just didn't want to leave anything in the dressing room, so to speak. It's like, just, just go for it. And I think, you know, one of the other powerful parts about the film was uh, the various interviews that they did with uh, many of the people who were in the film. And so, you know, really they were the ones that had the full understanding of what they wanted to produce and um, had to uh, work with each one of us to in asking us questions and getting us you know to discuss the various issues. I think that also was quite um, amazing when you look at the number of people who had significant role, roles in the film they did a great job of getting historical information, really amazing, but they also got new information. And I think that really made the film more powerful to be able to be hearing the voices of people that um, were discussing not only our own personal stories, but also reflections on what was going on during various parts of the demonstrations and other activist activities that were happening during the course of the film. So it was really very multifaceted. They had to find the material, they had to create the material, and then having to edit the material, I think it was hats off to them for an amazing job. You know, when I think about that that quote, that is like the essence of this endeavor, right? Is how could we tell, how could we tell this story, which, you know, I mean, Judy, Judy, I remember you saying to me when we were, you know, hanging out with you and interviewing you, like, do you know that some people don't even know there has been a disabled civil rights movement? And then we get to Sundance with this film, and it was like a wave of people saying to us, like, my God, why didn't I ever know this story? Why didn't I know this had happened? I think we were like taken aback by the extent to which people didn't know it, you know? And Judy said to people, well, maybe you weren't, didn't want to see it. <laughs> You know, maybe you should ask yourself that question because it's always been out there, you know. So, but we did know while we were making the film that the hurdle we were up against was people's bias, you know, and 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 the limited ways in which people see disability. And so we felt from the beginning that it was important that the story really read as this is the history told by the people who made the history, you know, and it and and it's the history told by the people who made the history as told to each other. So it felt very, um, you know, so people were talking to Jim 
And so they were, they were saying things like, well, you know, when we blah, 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 you know, whereas if they had been talking to me, if I'd been sitting at the camera as a non-disabled person, people wouldn't have spoken like that. And it was very important to us that it have that definitive feeling like, you know, we were here, we did this, we are, we are telling you this in the, in, with, in the way that we would tell it to ourselves within our culture, you know, and um, because it had to be that powerful that it couldn't be seen as like, now there's a nice little documentary about what disabled people did. It's like, no, this is like an earth shaking story about one of the great civil rights movements of our time, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, I, 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 I feel so, you know, honored um, to have been able to play a, a role in the telling of, and the telling of the story that the community would embrace and, and would see as representative of, of that history in that way, you know? I think one of the important parts about the film is, from my perspective, that it needs to be seen as the beginning of the need for other films and representation of disabled people. Um, you know, when Nicole was mentioning uh, when we went to Sundance and so many people were saying, why didn't we know the story? For me, you know, it, it, it was your documentarians or your people who go and watch documentary films. So there's a reason why you didn't know this story. Yes, they, it hadn't been told that much, but there'd been enough going on that if people wanted to see it, they would see it. So I think there's really a deeper story behind this about why disability hasn't been covered, people's personal fears around disability. And I'm hoping that this film not only educates people about the movement, but really enables people to, non-disabled people and people with disabilities that are visible and invisible to really recognize the power of story and how this can really help make reforms that so desperately need to be made in every country. Absolutely, and the, I mean, you, you ran a really incredibly successful uh, impact campaign alongside the film and you had over 9,000 attendees and it was organized by Stacey Park Milburn and Andrea Levant. How did that come about and what have the lasting effects of that been? We, we, well, um, we had this, oh, do you want to start Jim? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. We had this incredible brain trust that Judy was a part of, um, you know, uh, when we were maybe six months out from the film being launched, where we asked activists from like really broad a uh, uh, swath of, of, of people from, um, from around the country, um, from around the US mostly, um, working in disability activism, you know, what, how do you think this film could be most useful? And we sort of thought that there might be particular policy points that we could press on or things like that. And people said, no, it's not really about, it's bigger than just like um, one policy ask. It's really that there's, we still need places where people can come together in community and we still need um, kind of on ramps for people who may not see the benefit in identifying as 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 being disabled um, to to come into community and and find that. And so, uh, so we um, we had this idea that we wanted to create sort of Camp Jeanette like spaces. And at that point, we thought they would be physical spaces because it was pre pandemic. And we realized that we wanted to um, have the the program designed by kind of give it to um, people who are kind of, um, you know, working uh, in, in the kind of the most inspiring um, younger movement of today, because we really wanted to make a connection between the activism in the film, um, you know, in the 70s and the disability justice movement today, which is kind of prioritizing leadership and um, and the voices of people who've been marginalized even within the disability community. And so that's, we were so lucky to be able to hire Stacey Park Milburn and Andrea Levant, who are leaders in the disability justice movement. And when the pandemic hit, they were like, well, we can do this virtually. And they envisioned and designed this, you know, 16 session virtual summer camp um, that was every Sunday. And it became almost like going to church for people, I think, you know, and like you said, 10,000 like, camp. All over the like world. going to camp every summer. 
Yeah, like camp. And there was singing and there was teaching and the teaching all being done by by people who sometimes, you know, hadn't had th that kind of platform. Some of them had. President Obama joined in. <laughs> Judy came <laughs> the week that Obama showed up. Um, but yeah, it has been like a, a resounding success. And now we're hoping to um, to kind of bring that uh, to other countries and and uh, and, and focus it kind of um, even even more uh, globally in in the year ahead. It's been a it's been this incredible experience because not only do we have an audience that built up to about ten thousand people over the course of time, but you know, one or two Facebook groups just spawned out of you know on their own, and people again throughout the world being able to talk and communicate with each other, um, and you know we had we had a couple of things that we words or phrases that we had in the editing room to kind of look at. And one of them was an index card that said community. And, um, you know, uh, my gosh, that's what we've, you know, been able to uh, see grow and thrive and, uh, and uh, you know, sustain itself. I think as disabled people, we have such a history of isolation and, disenfranchisement and the community that you brought to the screen and to uh like you mentioned nicole to every sunday uh was something that i definitely joined in and it was just so transformative and i really really commend all of you for that what was it like to participate in, in it judy as a presenter Oh, it's great. The day that we did it with Obama was really, um, you know, he wasn't president anymore. And so he could really be himself. And I think it was, um, he was learning as he was talking. And it was, I think it was really very exciting. And to see, you know, Higher Ground really has been learning, I think, through this um, film and experience. So for me, it was great to be able to be with him, but most importantly, I think it was really exciting for everyone who was watching to see the high level of engagement, because a former president engaging is a huge deal, especially one that was loved by some, is loved by so many people. There are some videos on YouTube, um, and one of them was uh, showed. Uh, kind of the overview of our, our weekly get togethers and includes the clip of Obama and then Judy. And, you know, to hear President Obama do a image description of himself, which was actually quite funny. Um, uh, first off, you know, disabled Twitter just blew up, you know, it was like, look, and, um, I, you know, and so it was, it was one of those, you just get goosebumps, you know, it's just a, you know, quite remarkable. And I would say that if people are interested in, uh, I believe all you have to do is go to our website, which is cryptcamp.com and, uh, you know, sign up and I believe you'll get access to the videos. And uh, there's some good stuff there. You've made it so accessible in so many different ways and platforms. So thank you for that. Now, unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. And uh, to me, it stems from the film. And it's Evan White, the journalist who was featured in Crip Camp. Uh, he says of the protesters campaigning for the 504 bill to be, um, you know, waiting for the 504 bill to be signed. He said, I like people that make trouble. And I'm just wondering what kind of trouble each of you have in store now. <laughs> well, for me, it's... Um doing everything we can to support the Biden administration, to get disabled people in positions across government and to continue to support what's going on in the disability community. So groups like the American Association of People with Disabilities, the National Council on Independent Living, um, the American Association of People with Disabilities, which has this really great project called Rev Up which is getting disabled people registered to vote and um, getting disabled people really active in politics 
we're seeing more disabled people actually um, running for office and getting positions. I think that's all very important because I think the, the trouble is that the more we can get engaged, the more we can have, a, have an impact at the national, state, and local levels. And if we're absent, the changes don't get made as they need to be. I'm really hoping to do a lot of work, the, the continuing work in the uh, entertainment industry. And that indeed, as we see uh, in the media, just about every day, it seems recently, storylines that are really painful and harmful towards people with disabilities. These things aren't gonna just go away unless we are actually in decision-making positions as producers, as directors, and that we're not gonna see uh, a change in authentic casting unless um, people with disabilities are, have the opportunities to build a fan base and to, you know, to grow their box office draw. So I, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm actively working with some people on some projects and, uh, and also uh, you know, helped found an organization called Forward Doc, which is a group called, Film standing for Filmmakers with Disabilities Working in the Documentary Space. And that we are becoming an, uh, a, a known voice now in policy and, and advice for, um, uh, and really trying to advocate for other filmmakers with disabilities. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's where we really are at an exciting moment where um, where there's opportunity now to, to come in. I mean, for Jim and I in particular to come in with projects around disability and say, we want to do this a different way. You know, um, we want to have all disabled people behind the camera. We want to, you know, and, and people listen. And so um, so I think it's, you know, kind of trying to harness the power of that moment and, and push push forward and further, you know, than we were able to do even with Crip Camp and, and that's an exciting place to be in. Very exciting. Nothing about us without us. Yes. And, okay, I said that it was the last question, but I lied. And now, because <laughs> I just want to keep on talking. I could be here. I could be here for much longer. Okay, one more. Um, so practically then, for people who are wanting to engage disabled people in filmmaking. And I, I've used disabled people because that's um, my choice in terms of identity first language, whereas I know that, that everyone uses different language in terms of um, people with disabilities. We all use disabled people. We all use disabled people. Okay, great, great. Um, I, I, I think I heard teenagers with disabilities. That's why I was thinking of it. Oh. But, um, but it's just such a, a, a big thing here, obviously they're around language and I'm sure it is there as well. But um, the amount of disabled people that seem to be split between people with disabilities and disabled people, what is it like there? Well, I think it's a big, in some way a big change that those are the two choices because there are a lot of people that use other euphemisms. So for me personally, um, I use disabled people, uh, identity first language, but you know other people do use people first language, which is fine. They've made a choice to do it that way. But when there are other terms that are being utilized, I think more of us feel empowered to basically say, these are the two sets of words that we want to have used. Everything else feels to me, uh, we use euphemisms uh, differently, abled, or or such. Able, disabled. Like, yeah, handy capable was one of my. But I, uh, it's just a euphemism, and look, it's fine. Use the word, as as I think maybe Laura, our friend Lawrence Court along right. at a hashtag, just hashtag say the word, you know, and uh, and everybody has their their, you know, their preference. And look, you know, even the title of our film, Crip Camp. Not everybody's really thrilled with us using the word crip. And, but in this act of trying to reclaim the word cripple, um, it cer certainly, you know, here in, in the United States, it was a very important way of kind of showing pride, showing solitary, really kind of that, yes, I, I identify culturally 
and and politically if somebody with the with a disability uh, and um, we had to do not a, a huge push but a little convincing just to be able to use the title but and it was a wonderful conversation with Netflix around it like you know our research kind of says people are gonna think it's about the gang and we said we help us reclaim this word and if and if we all do a really great job in our uh, you know marketing no one's no one's going to be confused. Yeah, that's really interesting because there was a question about the language from one of the uh, Instagram questions that we had, and I've I've never kind of personally used crypt for myself. Um, I don't know. Do you think that's that's a symptom of of ableism? Of me? Have I not reclaimed my my disability if I don't use crypt? I think it's language. That I mean, you use language that's in your local community, right? And so I think that it just organically kind of built within our community here. But I don't, you know, I don't know. Do you? What do you call this? What do you call those parking spots that are painted blue? Uh, we call them blue badge parking spots because no, I, I call them. Oh, I say, oh, there's a crib spot. You know. <laughs> just. I think it's going to be interesting to see if people start using that word from within the disability community. I don't think the word crip is really a word that most people are using. I don't think it's because they've decided not to use it. I think using the title Crip Camp has introduced something that people can talk about. And you know, in 1981, the Germans had the cripple movement. And so I think crip and cripple is a term that has been utilized over time and it's not a term that I want non-disabled people using. I don't want them calling me crippled because of the connotation of what it means, but us using the term amongst ourselves and uh, as a word of empowerment, as the title shows in Crip Camp, I think is good. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like if someone who was disabled called me a crip. I think I'd be fine with that. And and I, I did have have someone who was able to try. I feel like tried to kind of resume the solidarity with me by using it, but it didn't work. So yeah. yeah. So um, okay. So my last question then is, what can other people within the filmmaking industry do to include disabled people? I think that if you look at other initiatives that have happened in our industry to when one recognizes the lack of uh, equity or representation that people apply that to people with disabilities and just because you haven't seen it before doesn't mean that it's not possible and so that means uh, really uh, auditioning people and auditioning people um, and casting people with disabilities for roles that aren't specifically around disability. It, it means whatever kind of um, apprenticeships or, or internships that you have, that making sure that they're open to people with disabilities and seek people out, recruit people, be active about it, do not be passive about it. Because in the long run, A, it's good for box office, because I think that when, when there are authentic stories and unknown stories and untold stories and unknown perspectives, people will just gobble this up. They will, they, they, this is what, what they want. And there are so many stories around in our community that aren't just tragedy or overcoming all odds, but romance and joy and, and criminals and jerks. You know, we're, we're all part of society like that. So, I mean, I, I, I really think that it's up to the entertainment industry to really take this on uh, because it's really harmful when, if, if they continue doing it the way they are. I also think that um, in addition to what Jimmy is saying, we need to be enabling people with invisible disabilities to be disclosing because they're the largest population. And yes, it's really appropriate to look at, look for people who are using crutches and braces and wheelchairs and scooters and sign language and captioning and 
canes and whatever and have intellectual disabilities on and on. But we really need to be able to get the population of people with invisible disabilities and intergenerational because the largest portion of the disability community is older. They don't align with us. And I think if we can really pull that together, we can become a much more powerful movie, a movement. And it, it is, as Jimmy was saying, you know, where do you find your talent? Where are you advertising? Are you making it clear that you're looking for disabled individuals? And in the stories that are being told, the more the stories that are being told reflect disability in part or whole, the more people will really begin to think about this as something that needs to be told. Um, but also, you know, the screenwriters, the camera people, the this, that, and the other jobs, and talking about it. And not just in, you know, the publications in entertainment, but in the general media. I, I, I guess I'd just add that on Crip Camp, you know, because it was being co-led by a disabled person, there was a disability culture to our working environment. And that enabled all of us um, who, you know, every single human kind of lives across a spectrum of disability, whether they recognize it or not. And all of us needed accommodations. But because Jim, you know, was a director on the film and was basically setting um, a standard that if you needed an accommodation, you could ask for it. Um, and all of us took advantage of that and it made the film better. You know, it enabled us to hire different people. It enabled us to like get, see people through uh, difficult times in their, in their lives and come back, you know? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I just think I'm, I'm very excited about it, um, you know, because of how it will increase disability representation in the industry and, and, and get disabled stories out there and help disabled people. And I also think it's just going to be good for, for art and storytelling and, um, and for everybody. Well, thank you so much, the three of you, not only for this film and the gift that that has imparted on all of us. I think I just, you've just really galvanized, uh, hopefully a generation of filmmakers and uh, disabled people and non-disabled people working together to make this revolution accessible. So thank, thank you. you for doing this. Thank yeah. you. It's really great to meet you, Tom. Thank you so much for watching. Crip Camp is now available on Netflix to stream. Good night. <laughs>